Ben Pyle, absolute pleasure to have you on HR Podcast. Um, and to actually listen to some of your previous podcast and interviews, found them really enlightening. I know you're a busy man, so I'm really glad we can make this work. And timely as well. Uh, before I, so before I kick into the, the, the main question, can you give me a, a little bit about your background, Ben? We're going to be talking about uh, the energy crisis, the energy cost crisis, um, climate change. So who are you to talk about that? And where does your knowledge and experience come from on the subject? So uh, I can't claim to be a scientist. Sometimes people get confused. I'm not a climate scientist, so we need to say that straight away. And, um, and, and I don't have expertise in engineering um, as such in, in this, this field. So I'm interested and I've always been interested in climate politics or environmental politics, so uh, environmentalism. Um, and uh, my only claim to authority then is that is that I've been studying this for for that long. So um, I, I um, skipping past my interest in the subject from about two thousand. Um, I started blogging in two thousand seven because I believed. There was quite a gap in the market. The debate about climate change and the debate about environment and energy um, had sort of become preoccupied with the question, um, is climate change happening? You know, yes or no. And I, I didn't think that was um, enough. I think you need, we needed to have a much broader debate and understand where Greens were coming from and what kind of world they wanted to create um, and what would it look like when we woke up in 2050 in the Green Utopia um, and I didn't think that was good. And, I, I, you know, I thought there were things that we needed to defend, like democracy. Um, and and there's a, there was a, I was aware of a very pronounced anti-human element to green thinking that I, I, I wanted to bring out. So I, I blogged for many years. I became a researcher for a UKIP MEP, Godfrey Bloom, um, in, in a, f- a few years later until about 2014 and then all along uh, all that all that while I was writing um, occasionally for spiked online um, online magazine um, so there's a sort of big archive of articles there for the last from the last 15 years um, and uh, you you know people people often say um, who uh, you know, more and more hostile than, than you have. Well, well, you're not a climate scientist. What are your credentials? All I can see here is that you've got a, a BA in politics and philosophy. Now, I was, I've, I've been quite clear about uh, what science uh, I think w- w- we can criticise as lay people, and and uh, and and that the quality of the science isn't. You, you don't need to be a climate scientist to. To understand a lot of these these claims um, and how a lot of the claims which are made are not made by climate scientists. You know, the, the, the climate crisis isn't uh, a notion that comes that emerges from climate science, um, and you, you 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 don't need to therefore, or even if even if it did, you don't need uh, a climate science qualification to take part in that debate it's a de- it's it's a it's a claim that the climate crisis is a claim that requires your obedience um and and you don't have to consent to it um uh, and that there's a lot of thinking you know you need to unpack why someone is is demanding your obedience on the basis of a of a climate crisis because it might be that we do face a climate crisis but it might be that even then, it's still worth burning fossil fuels for, for their benefits. You know, we, we need to do proper cost-benefit analysis and we need to ask, um, well, well, you know, an, an, an environmental, uh, you know, a form of government that's, that's organised around environmental principles might be far worse for us than, than democratic government, even if we make mistakes. Um, you know, even if there are, you know, that... that I'm, Nobody is suggesting that there are not environmental problems and that, that climate change might be one of those environmental problems. But there is, um, you know, there are many ways to understand that problem and many ways to confront it. And there are a lot of data um, that suggests it's, 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 it's bunk. 
um, that the, the climate crisis is bumped, not the climate change is bumped. So, um, yeah, that's where I'd wrap it up. Really, it's it's. Um... So, if, so <clears throat> on that on that note, then, if that's the case, why are we in? Why are we experiencing right now an energy cost crisis? Yeah, where is that? Really, what, why does that exist? Yeah, I think so. I, I think the energy crisis, the energy, crisis, uh, energy price crisis, is the consequence of about thirty or forty years of um, unchecked environmental thinking, particularly in the post Cold War era, around 1990, um, where energy policy, climate policy, green policy, um, were the were, were essentially part of a, a consensus that grew out of post-democratic politics, if you want to call it that. So, um, you know, through, through into the 2000s, um, you'll see there's no disagreement between, in the UK, so apologies to listeners from elsewhere, but it's the same thing holds, right? The, 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 the three main parties, Labour Party, Liberal Party, Liberal Democrats and um, Conservatives, they don't disagree about climate change. They don't disagree about energy policy um, and they even, you know, they even cement their lack of disagreement in in a you know in a formal almost consensus that's put to them uh, by green organisations. They say, "Will you agree to do this?" and not to not to debate it. Um, it was a, a consensus that was engineered by a very powerful green think tank that operates in in Westminster. You know, runs it even runs some of the. Um, not select committees, parliamentary parliamentary groups, the informal parliamentary groups that exist in Parliament, um, uh, called the Green Alliance, you know, behind a lot of a lot of um, policy initiatives, um, and, and and you know, so they got. I mean, what one one instance of this consensus is in uh, from about 2015 or 14, where they get uh, Nick Clegg, uh, David Cameron, and Ed Miliband to sign this document saying we're going to agree on on these particular. Policies. So, um, so the background to our our crisis now is in the UK a failure to subject the most one or certainly one of the most important policy areas to any democratic scrutiny, um, and then to not allow in other institutions in in government agencies. Or, or in public institutions like the BBC, not to allow any debate. So if you were going to go and say there's something wrong with wind farms and solar panels and renewable energy, the BBC were able to say, you're a climate change denier, you're not coming on, on the show. Um, and, and the BBC is a particularly, has a particularly powerful effect over the whole, whole of the media uh, news broadcasting industry you know, it's the the center of gravity um and other broadcasters simply followed suit so um newspapers were, were were maybe a little bit more diverse but but um they tend to be aligned to political parties so you know a a, a labor a labor aligned newspaper isn't going to be criticizing ed miliband for his environmentalism and 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 it was going to, it was hard for telegraph journalists to sort of ask questions about what on earth david cameron was doing on the rooftops of greenpeace in in 2006 so you know i mean you know, um over the years these kind of these kind of, the kind of people, some of them died, like good, good people like Christopher Booker, and some of them just got booted off out of the, out of the newspaper mainstream. So, so there was a lack of debate, a lack of democracy. Um, and, um, and then, it, then our energy system, as it were, our, our supply, um, was subject to this undemocratic policymaking. So, as I, uh, so since about 2012... In the in the UK's power sector, this is electricity. Um, there's about 30 gigawatts of coal capacity that was taken offline, um, uh, partly as a result of domestic UK uh, legislation, which is boilerplated EU uh, legislation, like the Large Combustion Plant Directive, which later became, I think, the Industrial Emissions Directive. So this just this this just sort of led to uh, a loss of very powerful plant base load cheap and abundant and affordable plant um but a lot of this was mitigated to some extent by the increased use of 
of uh, gas. So a lot of Greens will say, oh, wow, look how much power we create from renewables. And that's kind of true. Um, but as a percentage, the number of the, the amount of renewables on the UK grid has increased a, a, a great deal. But overall consumption has gone down. Um, and and uh, the, 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 the real effect was for coal to be displaced by gas, not, not for renewables to, um, as an absolute, to replace fossil fuels. Um, so our grid became very gas um, dependent, whereas in the past, you would get gas and nuclear, sorry, coal and nuclear providing, you know, a, a, it's called base load, the minimum amount of electricity that you need. And then gas <coughs> would be, because gas you can turn on and off, as the advert used to tell us, um, ga gas plant can do the load following. So as the, as you get peaks in demand and then troughs in demand, gas is cycled on and off to try and to try and follow this. So when you in, have a lot of a lot of renewables, it creates a lot of noise. And and um, and now gas is being gas started to be used more for the base load, um, which is very it's not not the not the best application for it. Um, so um, I'm probably getting away from the question. Um, so um, these 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 are sort of like the, the changes that were made directly by policy. Now, a much more sinister thing that's happened, I believe, is that, uh, and maybe we'll come on to this later on, I argue that the green movement is would not exist without the uh, generosity, let's call it, of about half a dozen, maybe a dozen, possibly two dozen at a stretch green billionaires philanthropic foundations right so and they and they pour absolutely endless streams of money into into environmental organizations um for example jeff bezos has recently given 10 billion to to the green movement and that's all just going on on green campaigning organizations and, and you you name them um, uh, and, and they're likely a beneficiary. Another is uh, Mike Bloomberg, the the news media mogul from the US, and he's he's put eleven billion into into philanthropy. So he calls it, and a lot of that philanthropy um, finds its way into, for example, anti car uh, campaigns at local local governments. So a lot of the LTM movements that we've seen, a lot of the clean air movements, they call themselves clean air movements. They're just they're just uh, their attempts to remove cars from cities to take cars away from working people um these 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 turn out to be you know um nth generation <coughs> projects funded by mike bloomberg and our own uk billionaire that i go on about a lot um is sir christopher hone who, who in 2020 he he spent 180 million uh, dollars on on green campaigning organizations now you now how they worked what what the likes of Hone has done and Green uh, and, and Bloomberg is to create to create <clears throat> with others um, a, a movement called ESG. Uh, so it's a shareholder investment movement. Um, and what that what that was an attempt to do was to use the financial markets as a form of governance, as a form of regulation. <coughs> Excuse me. So it, um, e ESG. Um, the E in ESG is environmental and the, the S is social and the, the, the G is corporate governance. Um, and so what they, they tried to do was claim to, inv to suggest to investors that if you put your money into fossil fuels, there's a very high chance, there's a big risk that the assets are going to depreciate too fast for you. To, you, you know, they're gonna, they're, they're, they were, they were, were going to be stranded it was called, you wouldn't be able to sell them and they would diminish in value and they would yield lower and lower returns. Clearly something that we've seen is not the case because of the crisis that we're in. But anyway, they told investors that, that um, governments were likely to take their assets away from them or find them liable, or find the companies and, and then possibly the shareholders liable for causing um, uh, global, catastrophic global climate change, right? So, um, so they said, you know, they've been trying to take Exxon to court, for for instance, a, a lot, and many other, you know, there, there, there's hundreds of, 
of court cases all over the world in which green organisations, also funded by Mike Bloomberg and Christopher Hone and, and the such like, and Leo DiCaprio, we learned a few weeks ago, has, has spent a few million on, on trying to get um, uh, companies to be found liable in courts for future climate change that will affect the plaintiffs, the, you know, the, these, these puppets that have seemingly brought the case, uh, the, 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 you know, so, so try and they, they, they find a dozen or so kids. Um, and then they say, these kids are, these kids futures have been ruined by global warming. Um, therefore Exxon or BP or Shell are responsible. So you get, you get lots of these cases. And that was an attempt to tell shareholders to show shareholders that their money was at risk. Cause at some point the courts are going to find in the favor of the plaintiffs. Um, so, so this is like the performance wing of the ESG movement, if you like. So this frightened um, shareholders away from the, um, uh, uh, fossil fuel from hydrocarbons and towards ESG stock so, so they would go and buy stuff and it also required um, shareholders to write to the companies that or the banks or the financial institutions that they had interest in such as uh, Barclays and say you're funding fossil fuel companies you must stop um, or we will sell our shares. They, it was called that. That part of the movement was called divestment, the, uh, and uh, and they persuaded a lot of institutions with a lot of money, such as um, uh, universities in Britain and America, some with billions in endowments. You know, in the <coughs> operators' charities themselves. So they just pulled the money out. Anyway, the result. The, to cut that story short, the result is that on uh, the, the the capital. Um, the cost of capital for hydrocarbon air, air energy projects um, increased. In the case of offshore gas, I think it increased to 10%. Um, and then for oil, and, uh, for, for oil, it went over 20%. So if you, you, you know, uh, and uh, the costs, the, the, the result of that, inevitably, it's, it's, it's a throttling, um, you, you know, standing on the neck um, of an industry is investment just went down like this. People still needed uh, hydrocarbon energy and, and the demand was still going up, right? Anyone could have looked at this data and seen the cost of capital is going up, the investment is going down, and this is before COVID, um, and, and, uh, but, but demand isn't, isn't slowing. It's still, it's going up and up and up and up and up. So this is inevitable. This, 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 the, a, a crisis of this nature is is indicated by the lines on the charts necessarily. So um, then we have COVID lockdown. Everyone locks down, and actually, energy companies have to shut down. They have to ramp down their production. There was an instance in which the the, the demand became so low that the whole supply chain ground <laughs> to a halt, and there were ships in the middle of the oceans full of oil that were being unloaded, that were being, whose cargo was being sold off at negative cost. They'd pay you to take it away from them because the, 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 the situation was just unprecedented. You know, it takes, it's a huge supply chain um, with, with a lot of repercussions. And I mean, Greens were cock a hoop that, that this, this sort of proved that fossil fuels were, were, were sort of some uh, irrational thing. Um, any, anyway, so, so, um, uh, when we recover from COVID, um, well, when, when the lockdowns are lifted, a lot of, a lot of companies found that they could not increase um, production because they didn't have any capital. Um, so a lot, of, you know, a, lot of, a lot of people were laid off throughout the world in the, in the sectors. A lot of plant was shut down. A lot of wells were capped. Um, and, and then suddenly when, when you're allowed to do things, when people are allowed to go out again, when they're allowed to go on holidays, when they're allowed to fly, um, well, demand, demand increases. And so this exacerbates what the curves on the charts were telling us before COVID and, it, and, and, it, and catastrophically. So, and and if, you, if you can remember at the time, people were going, isn't this wonderful? This lockdown, the skies are blue. The streets are empty. The wildlife is returning. And that's true in a sense. If you like that sort of thing, it's, it's a sort of slightly prettier state of affairs. But actually, it was catastrophic. Um, and and uh, so a lot, of, a lot of people have tried to use the 
problems in the energy sector to to <coughs> further the the green agenda. It's the build back better stuff. It's the it's the leveling up stuff. Um, you know, can, they, can they, I pull you back a sec? Can, sure, yeah. Sorry, can, can I jump in? Um, coming back to you said earlier, I think you, you what you said in if I paraphrase is that the roots of it begins post Cold War in yeah. policy initiative. So explain that to me. What? Why then? And right. What yeah, was yeah, it? If yeah. that's the case. Yeah. So so um, I mean I, I may I, I'll, I'll just add to that. All of these indicators were known to the likes of policymakers such as Rishi, Rishi Sunak and the, 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 you know, the, the governor of the Bank of England. It's not possible for there not to have been a, um, uh, an awareness that, that there was an, a diminishing um, supply of energy and increasing demand that were being amplified when lockdown was lifted um, and that this was going to have inflationary, big inflationary impulse. Um, they didn't care because it's not in their priorities, right? So for the, it, 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 you, if you read some of the Bank of England's uh, considerations about climate change and economics, it could be written by Greenpeace. Now that's significant because it means that green thinking, green ideology has become embedded in the institutions of the British state, right? So, so, so when I say there's no d democracy, there's no debate, uh, um, for you know since 1990 um, uh, it, it's exactly that it's got to the position where nobody within that you would expect to be keeping an eye out for this stuff say well the Bank of England's got this 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 really nutty idea that if we if we all are powered by wind turbines then then we'll all be richer right uh, there's no one scrutinizing that from within 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 the establishment from within the state um, uh, you know, and, the, and, the, and there's no sort of um, cognizance of the fact that the public might have a different view on, on the agenda, on, on the reorganisation of society in this way, and the reorganisation of, of the principles on which society um, is, is managed by government. Um, we, you know, we, we might disagree and we, and we might not want to carry the consequences of, of, um, of, of that, that new configuration of, of the state so so um I, I i think that their sort of indifference to people's needs um and if you like their intransigence to criticism um cr creates the situation um in and maybe around a year ago you've got rishi sunak remember everyone now knows in 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 autumn 2021 everyone the Bank of England, the Treasury, the government knows that we are facing rising energy prices. It's it's <coughs> it's a really really uh, uh, um, uh, properly problematic increases. Yet Rishi Sunak stands on the sh the stage at COP twenty six <coughs> and says, "Hooray." We have aligned financial institutions with assets under management worth $130 trillion towards this project. This is a wonderful thing. But this is, that's what's caused the problem. That's precisely what's caused the problem. And he knows it. I mean, uh, Rishi Sunak, in fact, used to work for Christopher Hone at his investment firm, the, the Children's Investment, TCI. Um, so, so, you know, so he knows full well what what's going on within the markets he knows full well that there's an inflationary um force developing um but he 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 just carries on regardless um as does andrew bailey the bank of england uh governor um and as as does as does the government because they think they can take advantage of the crisis to further further their agenda they lose control um uh, because i mean in, in in many senses the green the the green these green strategies were far more successful than even they had imagined they would be. And they pushed the world towards post-carbon um, far faster than it was, it was, you know, it was capable of keeping up with. And, and, and it's all fallen over um, and it's caused this crisis. Is, is that clear enough? I could, I could go over it some, some part of it more, a bit of a rant, but... Um, <laughs> coming back. 
coming back to post Cold War, the origin yeah. the origin of of the policy initiatives then. So the so the genesis of where we are now is I think what you're insinuating. What why then? And what and what was it? Uh, mm. That was well. It depends on on what what level of government you want to talk about it at. But um, <laughs> I, the most interesting thing for me that I talk about quite often is um. Uh, I think it's the United Nations Human Development Report. Um, in the immediate aftermath, aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union, is is like uh, this. It's like wow, well, you know, now the world can get on with the project without this awful conflict that's been dragging down human development for the last it was since the end of the Cold War. Sorry, so the end of the Second World War, right? And it's true. Right, uh, and and if you look at if you look at all of the statistics from 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 all of you know the human development indicators from all over the world, you, you see things begin to radically change after 1990. This just unprecedented um, shift. Much of it, much of it, sort of uh, the central gravity of which is around China because it, it, but it's still a, still a communist regime, it's still a relic of the of the Cold War in, in a sense. But nonetheless, it shows that that that, uh, that that this wealth being created and wealth being finding its way or or being created <coughs> by by some of the world's poorest people and, and and you know you see this infant mortality i was looking at it today infant mortality in pakistan in 1950 in the 1950s was around 33 percent a third a third of children did not make it to their fifth birthday now it's now it's much much lower around three percent which is far too high but um, so I was looking at this in the context of the uh, the floods that have just happened, and people are saying, "Oh, climate change is getting worse." No, it isn't. Look at the data. This is the you know. If you imagine everything you've been through, all of the kids that you knew at school, your contemporaries, a third of them would not have been there. Uh, why do you say? Why do you say three percent is too high? Oh, because we wouldn't accept it here. We wouldn't accept infant mortality at three percent. Oh, sorry, I'm oh, sorry. Be, okay, so, okay. Yeah, okay, we, we, it needs. To, I mean, it needs to be zero, but it, you, you know, to get, we, we needs to be. Le- you know, it needs to fall by the same amount, the same proportion. I, I misunderstood uh, the context. Yeah, 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 yeah. I misunderstood the context. Right. Saying it. Sorry, I meant I, I saying, thought, yeah. <laughs> no problem. Um, so anyway, I, I was going off a diversion. Um, the uh, yeah. So the Human Development Report was really optimistic at the end of the Cold War. And then that guy got fired, <laughs> the guy who put, you know, the, the UN uh, guy that was put in charge of that. And the next episode is like a mushroom sh- cloud shaped hole filled by the story of climate change in the UN's outlook. It's not optimistic anymore. All of the threats of the nuclear war are replaced by the threats of global warming. So why? The, the, why? Why did that? Why was that the case? Uh, I think because I think that the, the sort of the, the nature of a global political project is that it requires, uh, 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 let me put it differently, every utopia needs a dystopia. You can't make an argument for a utopia without a dystopia to escape from. Even the original book, Utopia by Thomas More, he describes life in Tudor England and then he describes this mythical island. Now he's just making a, you know, he's, it's a, it's a device for him. He's saying we don't need to manage uh, um, uh, Tudor England in this way. We could get rid of the degenerate aristocracy or just its excesses um, and and reorganize society. It's a bit commie, but he's making the point as a warning, as much a more, uh, as much as a, an advocacy, right? So he'd say we could just get rid of all these rich people and, and, and then everyone will be able to use the land, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so um, the, the UN, and, and I think there is, I mean, you know, a lot of, a lot of green and women uh, do the same thing. They go from, from, from uh, green and common to a climate camp because their, their outlook, the ideology, it needs a global catastrophe of, of the scale of the, of, of the, uh, it's to fulfil, you know, their, their emotional understanding, their relationship. That's all waff, That's all deep waffle, right? Um, I think the institutions that were created at the end of the cold, uh, the end of the Second World War, and that sort of developed around the problem of um, uh, global global war. Um, I think they can't. 
very few institutions, public institutions, big political institutions, are not going to sort of say, mission accomplished, we're shutting down, right? It's not possible for them to do that. They, 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 have, to find, they have to find a raison d'etre. They have to, they, and, and that, that, that sort of, you know, there are interests embedded in, in those kind of political projects, even if they are sort of legitimate. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, when you put it when you put it like that, it, it, when you put it like that, it reminds me of uh, big farm, it, yeah, especially in the states where they need sick people, just they need yeah. an unhealthy, they need an, a, an, a, a large proportion of the population to be unhealthy so they can make the money. Now, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to, I don't really want to get into the, weed, the conspiracy theory deep conspiracy theory weeds, which sometimes when you talk about this, it can be. It, it can appear like that, but it's, it's not the case. But one, one thing you were talking about there, and we're going back to the, the uh, post-Cold War, as you were explaining, that you also referenced the Second, Second World War. When I, was, when I read Alex Epstein's uh, book, Fossil Future, now, he, what's interesting is, he references that, he says that in the 70s, 60s, 70s, the general consensus was among climate scientists, environment scientists, scientists and generalists who, who were, had expertise and, and, and researched that, that area, was that we were actually heading for something nearer to an ice age. We were actually going to have hmm. catastrophic cooling. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, yeah, a couple of decades later, as you explain it, maybe that seems to have shifted yeah. to bring us where we are now, which is interesting. Yeah, the the um, I mean that's the other the the, the I mean um, I, I start my points that discussion there starts in you know nineteen ninety ish the end of the the Cold War but actually the the green the green thing probably started in in around nineteen seventy two so the UN creates the United Nations Environment Program in nineteen seventy two and it's very it's very instructive there's a really good video that the, the UN produced. Um, of their first environment program summit in in uh, Stockholm, um, and it's all the same arguments. It's all it's, it's like it's, it's, I mean, it's it's lovely to watch just because it's the same arguments, different cars, different clothes, and it's and it's shot on film, and and it's so it's all it's all like it's very nostalgic, but it's like nothing's changed. It's, and the only other th- Thing that's changed is none of them are then talking about global warming climate change they're talking about overpopulation and um, resource depletion because these were the main sort of stories in the climate in the environmental narrative at the time you know there's a paul ehrlich's famous book um the population bomb uh, the, the the bible for baby haters um, I call it, and then there was the Club of Rome, which is, I mean, you know, the, 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 this this agenda was kicked off by a guy called Morris Strong, who was an oil tycoon, and he was just let, allowed to create UN bodies um, with using his money and the money of the Rockefellers. We're going into the conspiracy weeds there, but it's historical <laughs> fact, right? So then, um, so so, and, and, and the, the video has uh, Morris Strong there talking about his project and. Um, and then, and yeah, so, so, I mean, Alex is right that people thought that global calling was on the way. That's more towards the end of the 1970s, 1979. There's another great video of um, uh, Spock from Star Trek, Le- Le- Leonard Nimoy, is that right? I think. And he, he, he did this show, this sort of um, science-y show um, talking about while well, most scientists are projecting that, that we're on the verge of an ice age. Um, but, but climate change wasn't... Um, wasn't as big a deal in the 70s at the beginning of the sort of the beginning of the global environmental movement and the UN's sort of embrace of the the, the movement. Um, that really comes out. I think this is another reason perhaps for the turnaround. Um, there's a very, in, I mean, and it might be that just they didn't have enough transistors in, in the, um, it was in the 1980s that, that um, the anti-war movement and, and sort of anti-war <coughs> scientists um, started worrying about nuclear winter so either and that and that was that even a relatively small nuclear exchange would produce so much dust uh, and so much dirt throw so much into the atmosphere that would cover the world for for a couple of years um and uh and and that would lower lower um 
the the temperature uh, to to um, you know so, so it was no longer sustainable. Life was no longer uh, sustainable in the real sense of the word, not the BS term. So the um, uh, so those 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 models, those computer simulations, were then then sort of developed into GCMs, uh, global climate models um, of the effect of CO two in the atmosphere. So, um, you know, they started to build more powerful computers than, than had been available, um, you know, supercomputers that were able to start sort of um, producing these storylines. Um, so so that, that, that's, that's sort of the innovation that gave, gave and, so, and so when the, the you know, the, the, the problems of nuclear, uh, nuclear war, global nuclear war, um, were sort of taken away, you still had the models, um, the, you know, and 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 that's been that's been all the rage from the seventies. Is this and and it's a it's a, it's unexplored in in, in the debate, and I, and I think that's a pity. Is um, what's called cybernetics, it's just, uh, and and um, other things that the likes of James Lovelock pioneered, um, which is that you can model. Uh, the natural world and you can model the human world and you can model the interactions between them now um as a, as, a, as a science that's been a dismal failure and so has incidentally ecology which is the sort of the 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 the, the attempt to use um those kind of insights from modeling um and control um to to uh understand what's going on with the world that they they, they, they they have had not very little success the sciences but they have immense political utility they they're, they're very easy to use um because it because it's sort of it, it it's something that makes almost intuitive sense that you you can have these very simplistic models um of 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 how how the world works and from that you you, you can sort of produce legislation or, or regulation or start to explain um, what what political institutions you need to make sure that this there's no disequilibrium in the world that's that's the term that they're, that's the thing that they're terrified of so there's a, uh, uh, and, and so it all looks very scientific but what what when you sort of start to pull it apart what you realize is that the myth of balance the myth the, the of homeostasis um, and equilibrium precede the modeling, right? They, the scientists don't find equilibrium or balance. It's presupposed. And it's a, I argue it's a mystical presupposition. It's an ideological uh, presupposition that, that computers only find because they're circular, the, you know, the, the, the process, the, 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 the scientific process of producing these models saying, oh my God, look, the world is out of, out of, out of equilibrium. The whole system is going to collapse. Now we just have to work out when. So they, they build these models uh, and it says, oh, we're good. society is going to collapse in 2021. 20, and 21, 21 comes along and it turns out we're all richer, we all live longer, we're all healthier, we're all wealthier, blah, blah, blah. And they go, oh, it's not, it's not if, it's when. So it's probably 2040, or it's 2050, you know. And so, um, and, and then what, what that urgent urgency and that hysteria denies us is an opportunity to point out you, your models presuppose equilibrium. And, and it's not a thing that you understand. You, 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 you know, so you, you can't, you haven't modeled the world properly. It may not be possible to model the world properly. And, and so we have, to, we, have to understand, we have to ask the question of whether equilibrium, homeostasis, balance, harmony, nature have any scientific meaning whatsoever. And that's, that's at the root of, 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 of green uh, thinking, I think, and that's the problem with green thinking. But that may be too that may be too much of a of a rant against it. I hope, no, I no, 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 not at all. It's interesting because it is it's it's one of those. I mean, there's a few areas like it, a few other things like it, like um, sorry, trying to you know trying to model climate impact, Mother Nature, the impact in the world, even just the impact that we have on the world, even just you know doing it in a 
in, in one geographical area, the impact the city has on the surrounding environment, from humans to building infrastructure, it's so complicated. I think it's, it's extremely difficult to do right now, but it doesn't stop people claiming to think they understand it or can predict it in the future. Um, yes. Now, now, how much of a part is, so you, you mentioned the pandemic, the, the strangulation of energy supplies there because uh, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, some energy supplies there because of the pandemic and lack of demand. Uh, the, um, and then the build-up of the green policies throughout the 90s, noughties, to where we are now. Um, I've got, so I've got a few questions. So first one is, if, because it seems, seems to me what you're saying is it's plain to see that the g- green policies are, in, are doomed to fail. They're unachievable. They're doomed to fail. So one is that they're irrelevant. They don't, they, they're not, they're not realistic what they want to achieve because they're addressing an issue that doesn't exist for nefarious purposes, of which that in itself is complex, right? Um, but why would, so why would, government, a government, any government, commit itself to policies which are so obviously not achievable? Um, or so, targets, target, tar- sorry, yeah, targets no, that are so obviously not achievable. That's a really good question. And um, so, so first to point out, having said all that, right, so I, I think at the core of environmentalism is a misconception of nature and a lot of other baggage. Um, I'm not, and so I, I would reiterate this. So I, I'm not saying there's no environmental problems. I'm not saying there's no pollution. I'm not saying it's a good thing that in some places rubbish and especially plastic is just poured into rivers which go to the sea. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying it's a, it's a good thing when we emit CFCs and soot into the air and, and it hurts a local area. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm not saying Clean Air Act is a is a bad thing. Um, so I'm saying environmentalism has to be understood as an ideolo- uh, ideology. So we have to understand it in the terms that we'd understand capitalism, if you like, communism, socialism, Maoism, Stalinism, fascism, Nazism. It's all in the ism, and 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 uh, they manifest isms political philosophies isms manifest and develop in along historical lines for all sorts of reasons that are specific to the historical era um and so putting it back together why did why did this why did this this ism take hold um take hold at at a particular time at a particular place is, is always is a job of historians and and, and, you know, and scholars and, and so on. So I'll, I'll 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 offer a few ideas. So one is the possibility, as we were saying earlier, in at the end of the Cold War, something happens, and and uh, uh, what seems to happen to British politics. So let's let's be sp- uh, particular about it. Is um, in. Peter Oborn's, I think, book on Peter Mandelson. I forgot which one now. Peter Mandelson is quoted as saying, this is a post-democratic era, right? So this is, this is my complaint. This is what I want to defend is democracy. And we see the UK essentially cede power to the European Union. We see democratic parties, uh, well, seem erstwhile democratic parties, hemorrhage, vote uh, members or well, the conservative party loses millions of voters uh, of supporters members uh, the labor party and Lib Dem- liberal democrats equally and i've spoken about the convergence of these political the, these parties political perspectives and and um so the, and this is the the beginnings this is this is what underpins the process of, of what a lot of people have identified as globalism right so, so um, if you like, you can say environmentalism is a part of globalism, in that there is a in the in the post Cold War era, there's an attempt to build global institutions um, above democratic <coughs> control, 
um, whether that's at the UN, um, which obviously was, was a post-war, post-war, not just a post-Cold War institution, but that's the sort of model. Um, and, you, and we get these weirdo um, WF type organizations trying to contr- control that process. And I'm, 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 I'm keeping out of the weeds here. So I'm, I'm trying to be objective on just saying this is a process. The, de- 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 un- the de-democratization has, it takes many forms. Um, but it's an observable fact uh, you, you, uh, of, of post-Cold War politics. And, and many people feel left out of that process. Um, uh, 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 and, uh, you know, whether that's the e- EU membership and the policies that come from the EU or whether that's the stuff that the COVID stuff um, or whether that's just feeling what's the politically left behind you know, people people feel alienated from mainstream politics, and and you can see it in turnouts. It goes down like this. So, uh, I mean, I, I think globalization at its core, ideological core, is nothing. It's nihilism. There's nothing there, right? It just it's just an accretion of power um, because they can, right? Because there's no there's no contest of political ideologies. There's no there's no constituencies there. Um, you know, there's just people who can organize the world in their interests and, and everyone else. Um, but it, but the absence of um, ideology um, leaves those kind of global projects with the need for purpose. So, so well, what, what are you, what are you about? So I think powerful people um, and people who sort of want to sort of organize the world better, build back better and so on, whether that's at the UN or the WEF or, a sort of degenerate in number 10 who never really stood for anything, who never really knew why he was there. He just wanted the job. Um, so he could go down in the history books as a, as a sort of a Sats Churchill. Um, environmentalism comes to the rescue of such a vapid creature, right? Environmentalism say, well, it's okay, Boris, you're, you're, a, you're a planet saver now. He never really represented his, you know, his part, the, the, the constituency of conservative thinking, just as Ed Miliband never really stood for working, the working class interests, right? Um, and uh, God knows what Nick Clegg or Ed Davey ever stood for, but, but I, I, I doubt if you did in the final analysis, anyone will find a, a genuine um, reflection of what, of, of, of Liberal Democrat memberships uh, or, you know, voters' interests in, 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 in Ed Davey. Um, this is just sort of, I'm not going to insult Ed Davey, but the, 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 point, the point is that, that we, we sort of enter an era of, of anime and malaise, of intellectual nihilism, and environmentalism is is kind of in in this sort of post left post right um, ideological landscape, right? And environmentalism turns up, and it seems to be based in science, and it seems to have answers about how the world should be reorganized, and it says and it says what kind of institutions you need, and it sort of sets out the proper relationship between um, between between uh, individuals and and, and governments. Um, between the public and the state. So, so it's very attractive and it's very seductive um, and it's kind of sexy and it's kind of glamorous because of um, all, the, all the PR that's pumped into it. And I, and I just think you've got very weak politicians who don't really stand for anything and, and, and public political institutions that have a very, have, you know, the, their founding purposes are lost in time. And I think this happened, you can see this throughout the West and you can see it at the, the UN. And, and so, so environmentalism kind of wins by default. And a lot of these movements turn up at these, these, these organizations um, and they're just pushing it an open door. And there's no, there's no resistance to the agenda. I'm not sure if, that, if, if that's answered your question clearly enough, but I'm looking at it historically um, or attempting to. Now, every time you open your mouth, it, you, you're prompting more questions in my mind. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm consistently writing down on my notepad, yeah. No, it's, no, it's, re- it's, uh, it's really interesting to hear your, your thoughts on it. Qu- question. So, um, uh, what about the validity of the finger or, or in, in validity, validity of the finger pointing going on at the moment towards the energy, the UK centric, obviously, towards the energy companies, towards Russia, towards the Ukraine crisis? Um, is there any substance to that? 
should it should it be happening? Is there any blame or or yeah cause of the effect to be to be assigned there? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, in, in major major uh, points first. So I think um, Russia Russia's become the sort of uh, scapegoat or whipping boy or whatever you want to call it um, for this uh, this inflationary crisis, um, this pr- energy price crisis, um, and you know Biden's doing he's saying Putin's price rise. Putin's uh, Putin's inflation, but actually, um, I pointed out in a number of places. If, you, if you're interested, um, or if anyone's interested, uh, it, it, it's in my videos and it's in, in on my Twitter feed. Um, you, you just just plot a gra- graph of of uh, gas prices, historic gas prices, and then find the point at which Russia invaded uh, Ukraine. You'll see that the prices were spiking long before uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, um, and. and uh, Harder to show, but um, it's it, it's true all the same. Uh, people were telling me that there were energy traders were telling me that there were um, unprecedented price uh, signals uh, on the horizon uh, before even the troop troop build up began at the the border of Ukraine and um, uh, Russia. So a year before, could that not be? And, could that not be attributed to the political? Uh, climate at the time between Russia and the West. No, um, a... well, that, I mean that's that's been historically the case. Um, so there was nothing exceptional about kind of the the, the friction between Russia and the West. I mean, it's um, and, and, and as I say, this is the, this is the consequence of the lines we were talking about earlier. You can you can it's it's much more likely. I mean, it's much more Bl- Mike Bloomberg than it is Vladimir Putin. I mean, it's it's, it's provably so. Um, you know the, 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 his in, the interventions by the likes of him and the Bank of England, um, especially under the direction of um, Mark Carney, who's essentially um, Mike Bloomberg's bitch, if I can put it so bluntly. Um, and he used the he used the Bank of England to 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 advance those policies. So it, so, it all sounds like short term advantage there, though. I mean, from it, so if I was looking at it. Uh, uh, really, you know, really simplifying it and looking at it from a, from a like an investment perspective. Uh, you know, uh, the Jeff Bezos, the Bloomberg's, thinking, where should I apply my effort, I and money, uh, for gain? The 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 green initiative seems relatively short term compared to what. Yeah. You know, if if what yeah. you're saying is correct, then. And it's not the way to go. And long term, the thing, you know, we should be continue to use fossil yeah. fuels, no, clean up our act where we can, but use fossil fuels. And long term, um, Dean is there. We, we, well, I mean, um, on, we, we, we can sort of take maybe, maybe in that, you know, to be charitable, they didn't expect it to work out so well or to be in, in, in terms of the ambition or, or, or to, you know, to produce effects so quickly. Um, if we're less charitable, well, maybe we'll find that there are. This is a pump and dump scam. The ESG were pumped and dumped, uh, or, or, or vice versa, dump and pump. In that, who, who knows right now? Right. This is why you need scrutiny of financial institutions. This is why we need to sort of keep an eye on it because it might, yeah, it might be that you know there are, there are people who have funded it, who sort of deliberately um, wound down hydrocarbon in sectors in order to be able to put their money there and then take advantage of the inevitable, let's remember, in, in, inevitable price rises. And they, they are phenomenal price rises in just on commodity, just on the price of the commodities. If you, you know, you could, you could 10x or 100x your money in this way. Uh, and you could turn a billion into 100 billion. Um, you know, you, you spend, you know, a, a couple of hundred million on the PR to, to I mean, I don't know. I mean, that, that's speculation and that, that sort of mm-hmm. that leads to conspiracy theorizing, but it's possible. And, and that's the sort of thing that typically you would have financial institutions looking out for. They would say, who's buying shares in what? What interests have they got? Is there something funny about the timing of these purchases or these sales or, or, or um, these acquisitions or de, uh, what do you call it, the sell, sell, selling, so, uh, so disposals. So, so, you know, there are people who would normally be on the lookout for that sort of thing. 
but 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 aren't and and so and and so uh, they need to be we need to sort of look more closely at the relationship between um people with a lot of money in politics and and their investments and so on but actually instead what you'll find is um the un chief um pretty much doing a, a real-time hagiography of mike bloomberg you can't get enough of him he loves him um, you know, there's a, there's a clip I use in one of the videos of him saying, you know, pretty much calling Michael Bloomberg a saint, as if as if Michael Bloomberg hadn't increased his wealth during lockdown from around 50 billion to in excess of 80 billion dollars. That's just a, I mean, I didn't do that well out of lockdown. I bet you didn't either. But to to increase your wealth by over 30 billion in a couple of years is just an insane amount of, uh, I, I don't know what you'd call it, that, 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 that raised no eyebrows. So how did he manage that then? I don't know, actually. I've not, done, I've not done the deep dive on his investments. They're too, too um, you know, Forbes keeps a track of, of what people are worth. Um, and I, I only use the figure to point out that, yeah, he spent 11 billion on philanthropy, but if you spend 11 billion to gain three, to gain 30 billion, you're quids up in. Yeah, that's in, not philanthropy. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's not. So we are where we are now, Ben. Um, I said we are where we are now. It's certainly in the UK. I don't want to speak for other countries. I know, I know you don't want to either. Or other countries, people's opinions, right? But um, I'm definitely afraid of the pinch, the cost pinch, definitely afraid of it. Most other people are, I think. I'm, I, I mean, I say afraid, maybe afraid is the wrong word, concerned about it. But one, because it seems to me there's going to be a price rise coming. There's already a, pro- there's already a price rise happened. It's going to continue. But yeah. the, the, the uncertainty of how big that's going to be and the way the numbers are being, the, the, the high end potential for the numbers are being uh, communicated in the media is very, very concerning um, if they're to be believed. But where we are now, right? Short term, and long term, what do you what do you think could or should be done to try and stabilize things now and pull things back to a sensible uh, a sensible situation in the future? Um, realistically, realistically, I don't think yeah, there in are. Fact, any... In fact, sorry, sorry, what, sorry, sorry, to jump in. Do you think that this this price rise could? This situation we got at the moment, the, the price crisis. Do you think that it could um, it could start to turn people's opinions on the on the green policies, and or cause them to look a bit more in depth, a scratch beneath the surface of why we're doing yeah. what we're doing? Uh, th- that's a really good question too. Um, uh, so I think that would depend on how successfully the likes of Boris Johnson and his successor convince the public that it's Vladimir Putin, not Greta Thunberg, that's responsible for this, right? So I, I'm, j- I'm joking. Greta wasn't responsible for this. She's just, uh, she's, she's just a kid. She doesn't make any decisions for politicians. They just hide behind her, that's all. So, so, the, um, sh- so it, ho- ho- you, you know, Boris is sort of in the mail the other day, Mail on Sunday, I think, saying the price... the the prices were, you know, these price rises, your energy bills going up to four or five, six, maybe seven thousand pounds a year. I, I, I think maybe that may be too alarmist, but we'll see. Um, he says that's a price worth worth paying for defending freedom and democracy in Ukraine. I think I think we're not defending freedom and democracy. That's that's another story. I, um, but I think that's a sort of uh, um, uh, a sign of desperation on the establishment's behalf that he's making that, those kind of statements because the bottom line doesn't work like that for most people. Like, it's, 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 it's not like kind of, oh, well, I've lost my house, I've lost my job, I can't go on holiday, I can't buy food, I can't, can't, do, can't buy the things I need for my kids, but at least I'm defending freedom and democracy in Ukraine or at least I'm saving the planet. People are going to ask, I hope, and this is the question that you should ask, um, is climate change policy better or worse than climate change because I, I i reckon we i reckon that seven or even even the bills that we've got on the cards now are four thousand pounds a year i think that's going to do a lot more harm than any plausible degree of climate change will do 
So, so um, that once people start asking that question, and it's not like you have to ask people that question, right? Assuming the <laughs> emphasis, I don't think people are going to be persuaded that four thousand pounds a year is worth it for Ukraine, and I don't think they're going to be persuaded it's worth it for climate change. So, so, and and people will ask, ask ask that question themselves when they start feeling that when the lights get cut off, when the power gets cut off, or when they can't they can't do the things that they're used to. Um, uh, that they'll say, I don't think this is worth it, um, when, if they're given the choice. I think there is cognition of that in the Tories. So I think both, even though Rishi Sunak has said um, he's not going to uh, cut net zero, I think he recognises that it's got to change. Um, I think it's still up in the air. I, I, think, I think Liz Truss is a little bit more um, a little bit more sceptical of net zero, but it, it, the question is, is she going to be capable of resisting the forces that are around her in much of the way the, the forces that were around um, uh, Boris Johnson um, during the pandemic? You know, it's, it's, not, it's not like that she's on a throne and what she says goes... Nor, nor he, although no matter that they treat things like a coronation, they're surrounded by people, they're surrounded by the civil service, they're surrounded by the party, there's a very strong green element within the party. And then, of course, we may end up with Labour. So I may be straying from your point. Could you remind me? Sorry. Your question. Short, no, no, it's fine, because I am. you started answering it, I ambushed you with another question. So short-term and long-term um, uh, actions that we, government, could take to... Well, right, so it's short term is stabilized. So, yeah, short term stabilized, right? Yeah, I, I mean, we, we uh, so there, there is not much when you're in that kind of this kind of crisis. I don't think there's much you can do um, because the the option you 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 know you it's like what what do you do once you're falling? You you you, you can try and cushion the landing. Um, there, and there are lots of crazy ideas out there that aren't going to work. There's nationalisation. Um, as if the government was uh, was 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 a better manager. I mean, we've seen it. The same people who say that the government is this corrupt, terrible organisation also want the government to be in charge of pr pr energy. I mean, it's what do you want? You do, do you either love the Tories and want them to be in charge of your energy, or you know, get real. Um, uh, and and they point to France, where actually France is now eighty percent nationalised energy or power sector anyway. Um, is is certainly no better organised than than uh, than ours, um, and you know half of the French reactors are, are offline, and it's facing probably just the same kind of winter as we are. Um, uh, then there's there's Off, um, offline because of oh, sorry offline because of green policy. Oh no no I mean the the, the nuclear new reactors just sort of um, are old. They haven't been invested in France. Has been a bit of a basket case for the last few since you know the Chile mm. Jones. They haven't been maintained. They haven't been you know the uncertain energy policy has has sort of mm. led led to just sort of uh, poor poor management. So a lot of them are offline because they need to be fixed. Um, but then it, you know it's got this and it's got the same problems with gas. I mean they they they, they are saying. France is better because the energy price cap there only went up 4%. But actually what happened, um, I mean, it's true, France has only gone up 4%. But if you remember, price rises three years ago in France sparked the gilets jaunes and a year of violent protests um, clashing with the police for every weekend uh, in, in every major city. So they, they need to avoid that. And, and, uh, and, and in any case, even though uh, the French energy company is uh, uh, largely state owned, it's still suing the government, right, for, for, for the price cap because this can't operate. So it's, it's you know, the, mm -hmm. so um, it, the other thing that people are suggesting that happens in the UK is um, that we just pay people's bills. We give people money to pay their bills. But the problem with that is if you look at supply and demand, if you're chasing, if you're giving people money to chase a resource which is scarce, which then then all that that may do is increase the price in, indefinitely. So you may end up with a, a runaway price signal. Um, and so it, which will have no, no good effect. Um, I forget what the other the, the other option that the Labour Party the, the the taxing the windfall stuff. But again, you take the money from the company to buy the energy, and it just pushes the price up. So these these aren't these aren't very workable solutions. The only thing that you can really do in a supply crunch is find a way, 
as quickly as possible to increase supply. You know, that's not nuclear. It's not wind turbines. Um, so uh, one thing that might happen is that demand is reduced by, by, by just businesses folding. I mean, we've got, we've got reports that pubs are just closing left, right and centre um, because they're being presented with 60, 70 thousand pound a year bills um, and they're being demanded up front as well because they know that there's a very high risk of, of pubs uh, uh, failing. Um, so, so pubs are just saying, that's it, we can't, we can't afford that. I mean, I've known people that have run pubs, really lovely pubs that have, have, have been extremely popular, but they run Why that industry margins. in particular? Why that industry in particular? Forgive my ignorance. Oh, I don't know. It's just the one that I think is sort of um, interesting. Uh, the, 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 there's been similar cases with um, takeaways, which should run on small margin. Oh, okay. a but there's a butchers. There was a but story, a few stories about butchers who they're talking who, small, um, small, small businesses, small businesses like uh, was, we, we, which well, have narrow enough margins anyway, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right, exactly. Yeah, and then you know I've seen a, a few, quite a few cafes put. You know, people. I mean, people share this stuff with me, so maybe I'm seeing, I'm getting a distorted sample of it. But yeah, little, you know, um, uh, mum, a mum and hu husband or mum and sister um, cafe in in the Midlands been bubbling along for nice, you know, nicely for ten or twenty years. Um, uh, and has had just about survived COVID, and then it's whacked with a sixty thousand pound a year bill. But it's only ever been two full time employees and a couple of part time staff, um, you know, making sandwiches. You know, just a lot of a lot of a lot of uh, the economy is 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 that is made up of stuff like that. Um, and you know, they're just going to go closing down. Um, because, because you I mean, it's, it's, you know, yeah, with the, with the pub, the margins are small, the same with these, these places and they're, and they're already facing rent and, and, and their own other price rises too, and a loss of disposable income amongst their customers. So it's, it's, it's uh, bad. So anyway, I've, I've gone off the point, the, um, which was, um, short term, short term, short term, short term, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so that might so that, that those loss of the, the small businesses and of industrial large industrial plants um, such as chemical processing uh, might shut down as well. So we have just seen in Germany um, the electricity market and in Europe the gas market. There's been a drop in, in the price in the last few days of about thirty percent, and everyone's going, "Ha ha, take that, Putin!" Um, and and that that everything may be correcting again. But this is this is naive because uh, first of all, their the energy prices, even if they fell thirty percent in two days, are still um, uh, a thousand percent of what they were uh, previously. And um, it might not be good news that the price is falling. It might mean that people are just go exactly as I just said. They're just going not buying, and people and buyers, energy buyers on the on the wholesale market, on the year ahead market, mm. um, they're going. We're not going to have any customers in a year, mm. um, and so the so they they're, they're closing it down, um, which is I mean. Yeah, I mean, we haven't talked about the influence of Russia in all of that, and the, the attempts to the sanctions against Russia. Um, which were just self-harming, really. But but that's that's for another day. I think environmentalism um, has enough of an underpinning in this in this um, this this crisis mm. that we don't need to. What about to get what about long term? I mean, in terms of increasing the energy supply long term, I know that uh, mm. I know that uh, nuclear is consistently referred to by people who are on the opposite side of thinking as being very. Uh, and uh, sorry, going back to your point to start, you're no, you know, uh, energy scientist or engineer, but you're well researched. In it. Nuclear being a good, op uh, a very good option, and uh, and all. What about fracking? And so one of the one of the patrons brought up the question of fracking. It's not something I well read into in terms of impact, um, but nuclear, I I think I am fracking or not. What's the viability of that? Well, um, to produce more energy. Yeah, I mean, we we weren't allowed to find out in Britain. Like we should have been, we should you know, if the Greens hadn't been so alarmist and and we'd been allowed to. Um, I mean, it's just, there's a video of uh, I use a lot as well of of Andrea Leadsom saying we're going to ban fracking 
in about 2019, which is you know, continuating, continuing the moratorium that the coalition government had placed on fracking. And there's a video of Ed Miliband, not Ed Miliband, Ed Davey, taking responsibility for, for, for the moratorium on fracking. But if, it, if, you would have, if we'd have been allowed to find out, is fracking viable? Well, that, would, that would have been wonderful. But it's always greens, you'll notice. It's always greens um, that are against stuff. And um, they made nuclear power expensive. So we, we, could have, we could have developed much better nuclear power technology. You know, there's, even, there's even reactor designs that consume their own waste or consume other nuclear reactors' waste, right? So, um, and they're, they're passive, they're, they're, you know, they're safe. In the event of a malfunction, they cease to produce a fission reaction. Right. And, and, and and less of an impact on the environment than oh, the much. green yeah. Well, um, op, op. Yeah. 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 Just, um, they, just bizarre. Um, they don't um they don't um they don't they don't yeah, I mean I mean some some greens now, Mark Linus, um who but he's still got a lot to answer for, has been sort of pushing at this saying the greens antipathy towards nuclear has been extremely 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 harmful self harmful uh, and he's right but he, i mean we don't need greens to make the arguments it's it's uh we should have we could have had um you know we could, if we'd have if, if greens had been really interested in saving the world from climate change um we we could have had a nuclear uh research program um that you, you know so I, well, the way i put it is this right uh in when i when i I, I did a degree late. I um, uh, went back to school, you know, when I was like in my thir early thirties. And uh, at the time, the the university wanted to expand, wanted to double in size, it was York, um, and that was going to cost it. That was going to cost somebody half a billion, five hundred million. Now, if you think that um, around that time was the start, the sort of the era in which we started subsidising. Um, renewable energy so now we spend about before this stupid price rise we were spending about 10 billion a year on subsidies for windmills for solar panels now what if and i'm not i'm not advocating this but what if rather than spending 10 billion a year or even a fraction of 10 billion a year on <coughs> on rent to feudal landlords you know big landowners what if we spent that on subsidizing stem stem students to do their 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 degrees their masters their phds in high energy physics what if we you know and then what if we like you know if you compare the costs i forget now how much the um joint european tourists and the ita projects for fusion costs in in um cern or near cern or i forget where it is but the you know what if you spent it, it turns and so it turns out that you know if you've got this every european country doing this spending their equivalent of of 10 billion a year you'll have 100 cerns you'll have 100 iters um in pretty pretty soon may and maybe 200 so like that's how seriously the greens want us to take energy they're not investing in a proven science that can that can help us produce energy. They're they they just want it to be. It's just wealth transfer. That's all that the Greens are interested in. Restricting the material abundance of energy, and and using that as a as a means to yeah. cement their own power and pass money. Not. Let's work out how to how to do fission properly, or to do fusion, or to do a hybrid of fusion and fission, which is how you burn waste. Um, let's let's um, let's make energy expensive. Let's yeah. Let's, I mean, above um, it, above it is greed, right? Uh, above it, it's a it's a wealth transfer. But below, at the at the you and I and Joe Bloggs level, it's it's ideology driven and. I mean, going back to your point about uh, uh, Johnson pointing the finger at Ukraine and, and, and suggesting that, not pointing the finger at Ukraine, but suggesting that, hey, it's, this pinch that we're all feeling, it's worth it because of that situation going on. Well, 
I think that that is a move to delegitimize any sensible conversation Joe Bloggs wants to have with Jane Bloggs on the Absolutely. subject because oh, you can't talk, you're not allowed Absolutely to look right. in depth at it because it's, it's wrong to think that way because, yeah. because they're, they're separate and it's, it's, uh, it's a complete misrepresentation of the situation. And it's a shame. You know, I, I, again, going back to, I think you mentioned it on the icebreaker, going back, oh, in fact, before we even start recording, you know, I, 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 I'm having this conversation to inform myself here, to hear other opinions. I agree with some of what you say, some of it I don't agree with, and some of it I'm just undecided. It's undecided, but without without listening to other people who've who formed decent opinions on the matter, you can't inform your own thinking. And I think it's a, it's a it's a lesson everyone needs to relearn. It really does. Not just from a client perspective, from from you know, interpersonal relationships to thinking about uh, um, politics and left and right and all of that. Like just uh, with such an, I think, with so such a misinformed, oil-informed population at the minute, and I'm talking in inverted, inverted, inverted comes to the West in general, it's uh, it's it's terrible because it leads us down paths. We get led down paths where we don't really don't want to be. You know, going back to the, the way you've yeah. described the situation over the last few decades, if that you know, if that is how it is, how you've described it, and how these things have come to a head, a, a major part of that is our own ignorance. In, in it's doing. it's an enforced ignorance though we, we we're denied conversations we're denied debate um it's not that that people are in themselves ignorant or incurious i think there's a lot of there's a lot of interest in 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 how in what what's happening you know in the in the science of it maybe not the science of it but the the politics of it the the, the you know the people want to know um, you know, people want to take part in discussions. I mean, that's what Brexit was about, right? I mean, if you take this, if you want to take a broader view, people said we want to be part of the conversation about how our lives are governed, and we we don't want this to be a remote thing. Um, you know, and that gets that gets muted, and that gets you know that 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 expression gets you know interpreted by various interests in various ways. But what clearer indication could there be that, that people don't have confidence in a political institution above democratic control, but they do, they do ask for the repatriation of their sovereignty. So I think people are interested um, if you let them. But I think, you know, and to your point as well um, about, you know, stopping a conversation happening that's, that's what a lot of, a lot of these sort of new organizations that are sort of, sort of analogous to hope not hate um and they they want to uh, and, you, and you see it for a number of journalists as well they're sort of saying if you question this then you must be pro putin if you challenge this then you must be you know you must be and it's like when, you know i've had, I've had it thrown at me a couple of times as a pro putin so listen i was making films in 2014 in favor of fracking i've i've argued against the deindustrialization of the uk um, for as long as I've been blogging, so since about 2007, saying it's a bad thing that we're ceding our manufacturing base to, to the East. Don't tell me I'm unpatriotic. Don't tell me I'm a traitor because I don't want there to be a war. You know, I've been, I've been at this for over a decade and say, you know, so making the same arguments. I haven't changed. Um, but they will say that's what, that's the kind of low tactic that they are, they're inclined to do. They set up an organization that will smear you and say there's a correlation, there's a link between people who are skeptical of wind farms and the ultra far right racist fascists, <laughs> you know. And and they'll 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 you know they'll produce some methodology that will sort of make it look like this correlation has some kind of uh, arithmetic thing, but it's just it's just silly and it loses sight of the, the debate. So, you know, they, they, and they, they're, they're, they're very powerful and they, they're, they're moving towards the regulation of discussion on the internet, such as this and on Twitter and, you know, the online harms bill. you sure as eggs is eggs, you know, an online harm in most people's view is, is you know, the, the obvious, the, the, um, the terrorists, the, you know, the child abusers, Right. But actually what turns out is it's people being nasty to Ed Miliband. That's what's going to happen. That's where that's where the real 
the real effect is going to be on, or, or, or even Liz Truss for that matter. I just plucked him <laughs> out of the, you know, you don't be mean to Greta. That's online harm. Don't be, you know. Um, yeah. So, so, yeah. so the, the, you know, so I'm not, I'm not, that's, that's almost as worrying as the energy thing, I think. We, we've got a, we've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, really enjoyed the chat. Really enjoyed it. Um, is there anything you want to cover before we finish up? No, no. Um, I, well, I, I'll say this. So, I mean, I, I completely accept um, some, you know, you're saying um, some of what I agree, will say you agree with, some you disagree with. And I think that's what we've got to, we've got to embrace that. And the, the answers, and, I, and I'm sorry I couldn't sort of say this is, this is how we're going to fix the energy crisis. The point, the point, point, important point is that we are allowed to debate and we should debate and we, should, we shouldn't be scared of putting our interests at the front of these sort of, before these claims that the, you know, the polar bears are going to die. It's, it's perfectly, as the crisis has shown, you've got to, you've got to look after yourself first. And that's what politics that's the sort of question that politics addresses. So people shouldn't be afraid of saying, I don't care about climate change. I'm facing a 7,000 bill, 7,000 pound a year bill, and my business is going to close, and I don't know where the money's going to come from, et cetera, right? So that's a perfectly legitimate position, and no one should be uh, scared of holding it, and no one should be uh, uh, put off by the science of the, or the science of the, the debate either. We, so, so it needs debate. Um, and... Uh, uh, holding holding politicians to account is is, is central to that too. So so um, yeah, let's 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 not be beaten about the head by by scare stories. That's what I'm saying. And we've got to recognise that environmentalism, as much as it looks like it's based in science, it is an ideological movement, and and it can be seen as an ideological movement with its history and its designs on society. So um, we should treat it like that, whether we agree on climate change. You can agree with climate change and agree something should be done, but you don't have to be Greenpeace member and you don't have to be a Greta. You can still put your interests yeah. first. Yeah, I like form an opinion, have an opinion, wherever that may be, but make sure you understand why you've got that opinion. One of the, wor yeah. one of the worst things I... I one of the worst things I think when you ask someone, okay, they, they form an opinion on whatever it is. You say, well, why do you think that? Well, well I just do. <laughs> that's not, that's, the, yeah. you know, if you can't explain why at a basic level, then you, you have to say to yourself, you have to question why you think it. And what you think may be right, but you have to understand why. Otherwise, what, what are you doing? You know, you, you lead yourself, form your own opinion, be, be your own boss. And, and that now, nowadays, it's, it's not the case because of the polarization, I think, and, uh, and that's a whole other different kind of issue. Ben, how can people um, listen, view, find more of you? I'm on Twitter too much, far too much, all the time. I just got to turn it off. Uh, at Climate Resistance, which is C L I M number eight resistance. Um, I have That's a blog. Cool. Yeah, it was cool, wasn't it? You used to, you used to <laughs> using an eight, but you, you, the fact is that that's exactly the longest you could make a Twitter handle when I oh. could when I started. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so you can't write climate resistance because it would be written fully because it would be too long. And um, anyway, and it used to just be the blog. You know, just would put the the articles from the blog up and just tell tell people when there was a new article. I didn't, I didn't, wasn't an early adopter. Uh, then um, I've got a website, www.climate-resistance.org. Sometimes that gets updated with the stuff I've been doing. Um, there's an author archive of all the stuff I've written at Spiked. Um, if you just type Ben Paul Spiked, that should come up. Well, I'll get the, I'll get the links from you and I'll put them all in the blurb of this podcast. And are you on YouTube as well? I'm on YouTube, yeah. Um, I think... I think it's just climate resistance is the channel title. It's properly, properly spelled. So, but you can search for climate resistance and it will come up. For the, um, for the, the, the link. No, Substack, yeah. people, yeah. keep, people keep saying, why don't you do Substack? I'm too busy on Twitter. Um, so maybe I should, maybe I should drop the Twitter and do the Substack. Is, uh... <coughs> I'll do both. Yeah. Both. Yeah. Well, maybe half of much Twitter. <laughs> Beth, mate, yeah. cheers for your time. Hopefully catch you for a brew at some point. And um I hope so. No, it's been a pleasure. Been a pleasure. Great chat to you. Thanks very much. Thank you.
that's it thank you for watching hey chower if you enjoyed this episode why not become a hey chower patron hey chower patrons get exclusive access to premium content with guests like the one you just watched there are private interviews with previous guests and with this guest that nobody will see except for the hey chower patrons so before this podcast was recorded I recorded an exclusive Q&A, a shorter interview structured around eight questions. All the questions were chosen by patrons beforehand, and that interview is online now for patrons. That happens every time. Patrons also get access to all of the episodes before anyone else. They get advanced viewing of the episodes. And you also get other perks and bonuses. All of the information is on charliecharlie1.com. Just hit the menu item, become a patron. It'll show you everything there, including access to the H Hour Discord community and private patron-only channels on there. So go to charliecharlie1.com and hit the menu item, become a patron. Easy peasy. If you prefer to listen to your podcast normally, H Hour is also on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Google Podcasts, it's on all of the podcast apps. And if you don't even want to bother with a podcast app, you can go to the, the H Hour website, charliechannel1.com, and you can actually play the podcast, video or audio, directly through the website, through your browser. Simples. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being a supporter. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I will catch you on the next episode. Thank you.